<laughs> okay. So that's my question. We're starting out with a question for you, the AI people. What, what, do, you, what do you think artificial intelligence is? Feel free to unmute and, and, and blurt out anything you want. Okay, I, see, I anticipated this. I've worked with high school age students before and I know you're gonna get crickets when you ask questions. So I, I'm gonna make it easier. I think, I think Jeffrey has something. Oh, um, good. yeah. Um, well, I, I was thinking like there are certain traits that we define as intelligence, like um, like logist, like being logical, being like sometimes creative. Um, uh, there's the, I remember there like a, there's a list of things that like I defined as intelligent, um, and then basically using the computer to emulate that uh, without decision making and um, something similar to that. Beautiful, Jeffrey, you made my life so easy. I was prepared to go to say, okay, let's break it down. Let's do the easy part first. Let's see what art, what do we mean by artificial? And you, when you said it, it's, it's machines, right? We wanna take machines in particular computers. Those are the machines that seem best, uh, most likely to be able to, to exhibit the things we call intelligence. Um, and we wanna see if we can make them smart like us, right? Um, yeah. and, and as Jeffrey said, there's a, a list of things that we care about in human intelligence. Um, I'm not here to answer that question. I think we, I'd like to, to start a discussion with you because obviously intelligence is the hard part. And if there's one message maybe from me as a neuroscientist to you is that we, we still don't really know what intelligence is. And, and I think we're gonna see that as we go along, but that means it's exciting, right? Because you are the ones who are gonna figure out what intelligence is and how to make machines increasingly intelligent. And I just wanted to share with you for, for starters, two of my favorite quotes. One of which is kind of kind of lead into the first part of the, my, my little presentation here. Alan Newell was one of the sort of founding fathers of artificial intelligence. He and Herb Simon, and maybe before them, people like John von Neumann, who you know invented the, the, the one architecture of computers anyway, um, that all intelligence is search in the appropriate space. I think that's a really interesting way, a kind of a concrete way to think about intelligence. And we're going to Think about that a little bit in the context of dimensionality reduction, which is a simple form of, of machine learning, but, but one that's very useful and very powerful, I would argue. And then here's one that I just heard. So this guy, Stuart Russell, is a computer scientist and a leading thinker on artificial intelligence. And he just gave four lectures called the Wreath Lectures on the BBC on artificial intelligence. And I can share the link with uh, for those of you who might be interested. They're, they're really interesting. And so he has this definition that machines are intelligent to the extent to which their actions achieve their objectives. And he goes on to talk a lot about, we have to be careful about how we define those objectives. And that's a, that's a tricky thing was machines get more and more powerful. All right, so any, any thoughts, questions, ideas about what's been said so far, Jeffrey's definition, some of the things I've thrown out? All right, so, when I was thinking about this, and I, I'm not really, I don't, I'm not a researcher in artificial intelligence. We use a lot of machine learning and statistics in our work. And I'll tell you about some of that, uh, at least the work of some of my, my former students. Um, so I went to Google like everyone does when they're trying to think about something. And I typed in some words and that you get a bunch of pictures like this, a lot of graphics. And you can see here, there's machine learning and AI here is machine learning is a subset of AI, but it shows no overlap whatsoever with statistics. That, that seems odd. That's, that's not right as we're gonna learn in a few minutes. Uh, you got one here that shows them kind of as three pillars of data science. Um, got another one here that doesn't even include artificial intelligence. Here's, one of, here's the favorite one that I came across here, which is statistics is this sort of kind of ugly little crack in the wall. Um, when we kind of put a frame around it and make it look more presentable, we call it machine learning. And then when we're presenting it to an audience, we call it artificial intelligence. And this is maybe the, the, the best quote. When you're fundraising, it's AI. When you're hiring, it's machine learning. And when you're implementing it, it's just logistic regression, which is a well-known statistical technique, but a, a very powerful way of classifying um, images, data, whatever, what have you. Okay. So any, any thoughts, questions about those definitions? That's a little bit cynical, maybe. Um, but 
when I really want to know something, I go to my gurus and I have gurus in all sorts of different fields, but my main guru in AI is a man named Michael I. Jordan, not Michael. Uh, I think the other Michael Jordan has a different middle initial, the basketball player. But I wanted to share with you this really interesting a snippet of an interview that lasts almost an hour and a half. And I recommend you, you um, uh, taking in the whole thing if you have time and are so inclined. But he makes this really interesting and I think powerful analogy, which he says that machine learning and artificial intelligence are to statistics as chemical engineering is to chemistry. So that sounds a little cryptic, right? But let, let's, let's go and see if we can, uh, can you see my, um, my browser here? Good, okay. The following is a conversation with Michael I. Jordan, a professor at Berkeley and one of the most influential people in the history of machine learning, statistics, and artificial intelligence. He has been cited over 170,000 times and he has mentored many of the world-class researchers defining the field of AI today, including Andrew Eng, Zubin Garamani, Ben Taskar, and Yoshio Bengio. All this, to me is as impressive as the over 32,000 points in the six NBA championships of the Michael J. Jordan of basketball fame. There's a non-zero probability that I talked to the other Michael Jordan, given my connection to and love of the Chicago Bulls of the 90s, but if I had to pick one, I'm going with the Michael Jordan of statistics and computer science, or as Jan LeCun calls him, the Miles Davis of machine learning. In his blog post titled Artificial Intelligence, The Revolution Hasn't Happened. Still alive today is an aspiration, but I... Th okay, so I'm, I'm jumping ahead a little bit here, folks. I just want you to hear what he has to say kind of about... He's saying AI is kind of alive today as an aspiration, and now he's going to go on to make the analogy. I think this is akin to the development of chemical engineering from chemistry or electrical engineering from, from electromagnetism. So if you go back to the 30s or 40s, there wasn't yet chemical engineering. There was chemistry, there was fluid flow, there was mechanics and so on. Um, but people pretty clearly viewed uh, interesting goals to try to build factories that uh, you know make chemicals, products, and do it viably, safely, make good ones, do it at scale. Uh, so people started to try to do that, of course, and some factories worked, some didn't, You know, some were not viable, some exploded. But in parallel, uh, developed a whole field called chemical engineering. Right. And chemical engineering is a field. It's it's no no bones about it. It has theoretical aspects to it. It has uh, practical aspects. It's not just engineering, quote unquote. It's the real thing. Real concepts are needed. You know, same thing with electrical engineering. You know, there was Maxwell's equations, which in some sense were everything you need to know about electromagnetism. But you needed to figure out how to build circuits, how to build modules, how to put them together, how to bring electricity from one point to another safely, and so on and so forth. So a whole field developed called electrical engineering. All right. I think that's what's happening right now, is that but, we have we have a proto field, which is statistics, computer, more the theoretical side of the algorithmic side of computer science. That was enough to start to build things. But what things? Systems that bring value to human beings, <clears throat> use human data and mix in human decisions. The engineering side of that is all ad hoc. That's what's emerging. In fact, if you want to call machine learning a field, I think that's what it is. That's a proto form of engineering based on statistical and computational ideas of previous generations. But it, do you think there's something deeper about AI in his dreams and aspirations as compared to chemical engineering and no. electrical engineering? Well, the dreams and aspirations may be, but those are, from, those are 500 years from now. I think that that's like the Greeks sitting there and saying it would be neat to get to the moon someday. Right. Um, I think we have no clue how the brain does computation. Uh, we're just a clueless. We're like we're even worse than the Greeks uh, on most anything interesting uh, scientifically of, of our era. Can you linger on that just for a moment? Because you stand not completely unique, but a little bit unique in that in the clarity of that. Can you can you elaborate your intuition of why we like where we stand in our understanding of the human brain? And a lot of people say, you know, scientists say we're not very far in understanding the human brain. Yeah. But you're like you're saying we're in the dark here. Well, I know I'm not unique. I don't even think in the clarity, but if you talk to real neuroscientists that really study real synapses or real neurons, they agree. They agree. It, it's a hundred year, hundreds of year task and they're building it up slowly and surely. What the signal is there is not clear. We think we have all of our metaphors. We think it's electrical, maybe it's chemical. It's, it's a whole soup. It's ions and proteins and it's a cell. And that's even around like a single synapse. If you look at a 
electron micrograph of a single synapse. It's a, it's a city of its own. And that's one little thing on a dendritic tree, which is extremely complicated, you know, electrochemical thing. Mm -hmm. And it's doing these spikes and voltages are being flying around and then proteins are taking that and taking it down into the DNA and who knows what. Um, so it is the problem of the next few centuries. It is fantastic. But we have our metaphors about it. Is it an economic device? Is it like the immune system? Or is it like a layered, you know, set of, compu you know, uh, arithmetic computations? What We have all these metaphors, and they're fun. Um, but that's not real science uh, per se. There is neuroscience. That's not neuroscience. All right? that, that's, that's like the Greeks speculating about how to get to the moon. Fun, right? And I think that I like to say this fairly strongly because I think a lot of young people think we're on the verge. Because a lot of people who don't talk about it clearly let it be understood that yes, we kind of this is brain inspired. We're kind of close, uh, you know. Breakthroughs are on the horizon, and unscrupulous people sometimes who need money for their labs. Um, that's why I'm saying unscrupulous, but people will oversell. Um, I need money for my lab. I'm gonna. I'm studying you know computational neuroscience. Um, I'm gonna oversell it, and so there's been too much of that. So. I'll all right, I'm going to stop it there. There's a ton of wisdom in those four minutes, and there's a lot more in the rest of the interview, so I recommend it. And just for the record, I am a real neuro neuroscientist. I've been one my entire career, and I agree with, with Michael Jordan completely. We're really in the dark ages when it comes to understanding the brain, how the, we, we understand something about intelligence from psychology studies of, of human reasoning and um, perception, for example, and we're going to talk about some of that. Um, but as to how the brain pulls this off, we really are still just scratching the surface. Um, and what I hope to convey to you today is a little bit about A, how we, we've done that, B, how that has informed machine learning. And in particular, I'm going to talk a little bit more about a form of, of artificial intelligence called machine vision, which has done pretty well. I would say it's one of the sort of leading um, uh, candidates for being best able to emulate something that humans actually do very well, which is C. Um, but but we we th these things have informed machine vision that we've learned from real brains, and um, in turn these things have sort of looped back and helped us think more clearly about the brain. And so what I'm going to hope to convince you is that there's a really exciting kind of 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 um, virtuous circle between artificial intelligence and studies of biological intelligence, um, and that these are really the exciting things for the future. So, but d do you have any reactions to the, the interview? Any thoughts, any questions about it? Uh, I, I found it interesting that um, like we're trying to, like we're trying to have machines do something that we don't even understand ourselves. Like we're trying to get them to do like, Hey, you compute, and we don't even know how we do it ourselves. So it's it's kind of interesting that we don't um, like we're trying to emulate something we don't even know how to do ourselves. Yeah, exactly. Now we we have some ideas as I as I hope to show you, and these have informed some of the things we're trying to get computers to do. But in turn, when you try to do them, right, that's one of the best ways to try to understand something, or at least to to test whether you understand something. Right? Can it do? the thing that we know the human can do as well as the human can do, right? And that's sort of, that was one of the basis of one of the most famous tests in artificial intelligence, which is um, was, was posed by Alan Turing is now known as the Turing test, right? Can it fool a human being into thinking that it's another human being, right? Um, and so we're gonna, we're gonna talk about that, but it, it's, it's, it really is the, the, the case that insofar as you can you know, program a computer to do it, you understand that thing much better than you would have if you hadn't tried to, to, to reduce it to an algorithm, right? Now, one other thing I'd like to just throw out there, there, there are people talk about weak AI, which are things like, can we get machines to do specific features of, of mimic specific features of human intelligence? Like we know that they can compute really well. They can compute much better, much faster than we can, right? They can even do logical, do logic pretty well, not maybe as well as humans in certain complex situations. And they can certainly do pretty well at vision. That would be what maybe people call weak AI. What people refer to as strong AI is sort of the thing of, can we get a computer that would be convincingly uh, versatile across the complete range of human intellectual capabilities? Um, and can it, you know, in, in, in essence, do anything um, that a human could do in, in, intelligently? And 
I believe that strong AI is possible. There are people who have argued, Alan, uh, I mean, Searle, John Searle, a famous uh, philosopher at Berkeley who put forth the famous Chinese room analogy, um, argued that against strong AI. I think he got it wrong. I think it's possible because I think that there's nothing in principle that we do as intelligent beings that is not a calculation, not a computation, right? It's maybe done in a very different way from the way a, 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 a von Neumann architecture computer would do it, but it's not in principle anything other than a computation. And so I believe ultimately anything a human can do um, a, a computer will ultimately be able to do, but but I I agree with with Michael Jordan that we're probably you know hundreds of years away from that, which means that your generation is in an exciting place to try to understand these things. Any thoughts? I saw Emmanuel, you uh, unmuted. Is there anything you wanted to say? I actually found it very ironic um, that. Um, going back to what Jeffrey had said, that we're trying to get computers to do what we ourselves don't understand with trying to have a computer emulate a brain. Um, and I actually took uh, an introductory AI course over the summer. And um, one of the first things he said was, when you program, you're going to be emulating the functions of the brain. And they had us, you know, lay out our neural pathways. So they had layer one, layer two, and then they explained propagation. And the whole time they're doing this, I was expecting to have some sort of revelation of, ah, this is how I think. This is how I figure things. And it just never happened. It, it yeah. was literally just telling a computer how to calculate based off of breaking an image into pixels. And then based on what the image reads, it spits out what it thinks it sees. And that's, that I... I don't, I just didn't have it click with how I think or how I think the brain actually works. And I just think it's really ironic that we're trying to project it as an emulation of the brain when we don't understand how the brain itself works and therefore how can we emulate that? But, but maybe, and maybe this is a thing. So, so th there's, there's an important sort of uh, framework that was introduced by a computational neuroscientist named David Marr back a long time ago in the 70, 1970s. And he talked about different levels of analysis of, the, of a problem, right? Like, and he was interested in the problem of vision. And at the lowest level is the theory of the process itself, right? And he used an analogy like, like, the, like the principle of, of um, let's say of, of flying, let's say the ability to fly, right? So there's a physics of flying and that's sort of the ground truth. Anything that flies has to obey those laws, right? So there's a physics level understanding, right? But then there's the kind of algorithmic level, which is how do you instant, how do you actually, um, you know, think of something, or, uh, you know, program something that, that could fly. And then there's the particular instantiation, the physical level, right? So many things can fly. Birds can fly, butterflies can fly, airplanes can fly. They all have to follow the same laws of physics, but they instantiate it with very different architecture, right? And it's the same for, for brains, I think. So we understand a lot about vision and even a lot about thinking at what I will say is the algorithmic level. But when it comes down to how that's actually instantiated in hardware, in the brain, or in any other thing, that's where we're particularly in the dark ages. So I think there are still things that we can do. We can understand a lot about how humans reason. How the brain actually does that is a, is a bit of a mystery. But it's conceivable that one could build something that emulated the brain that was following, that was doing the same thing algorithmically. Um, but, but we're achieving the same ends, but was doing it in quite different, different ways, right? So I don't think we have to sort of slavishly emulate exactly what brains do, because as, you, as Emmanuel pointed out and as Jeffrey pointed out, we don't, we don't understand yet how they do it. But I think there's a really important dialogue to be had between learning the tricks that brains have evolved, that biological brains have evolved over millions and millions of years, right? Um, and the, the, the systems that we're trying to build. In fact, there's a great, one of my favorite quotes is from a, a man named Warren Weaver, who was um, also important in the history of, of, of artificial intelligence. He was a, a pioneer in um, sort of artificial language systems or translating languages with computers. But he also became the, the director for the Rockefeller Foundation. And one of his 
quotes was the future of engineering will be learning from biology the tricks that it has evolved over millions and millions of years. So there's still lots of tricks. So we've learned some really important tricks about how brains see, how brains, how biological brains implement vision. And those have been very, very valuable in better programs for vision. And I'm gonna show you that directly, okay? So that's, that's part of my, my goal. All right, so here's a roadmap for some of the things I wanted to cover today. And if, if we don't get to all of them, it's no big deal. I'd rather have a, a dialogue with, with you folks. So I thought I would start simple with some very basic machine learning algorithms that do dimensionality reduction. And in particular, excuse me, I was gonna start with a toy example of principal components analysis. Did, I don't know if, so just as a, as a, as a reality check, did you ever cover anything called principal components analysis in your machine learning artificial intelligence courses? I see Carter shaking his head, so no. So it's a very simple, it's straightforward linear algebra. There's nothing mysterious about it, but it's very powerful for taking high dimensional data sets and reducing them to, to more manageable numbers of dimensions that can tell us a lot about the underlying structure in the data. And that kind of gets at what I was talking about with the quote from, her, from um, um, Alan Newell about search in the appropriate space. It's a way of reconfiguring space in a very simple linear way, but one that still you'll see does pretty amazing things. I'm gonna show you two then specific examples of real world applications, one in genetics and one in neuroscience. And then I'm gonna use the neuroscience one as a kind of a, springboard into this idea of how discoveries in neuroscience have led to advances in, in a form of machine learning called machine vision. And I'm gonna talk about really the history of, of vision studies from, from two pioneering investigators named David Hubel and Torsten Wiesel to how we got to AlexNet, which is now an outdated version of a, of a machine vision program, um, but it was sort of an important one. I'm gonna talk a little, just very briefly about some of the successes of machine vision and some of its spectacular failures. And then I'm gonna, the last point is this sort of this virtuous cycle that I was referring to earlier between what we learn from real brains and what we do with, with artificial versions of, of the visual system. And here we're gonna talk about some work that was done by um, one of my early graduate students. He was the second graduate student I ever trained named Carlos Ponce. Um, and he's using ConvNets to help him in studies of the visual system. And then finally, because Servan kind of asked me, I thought I'd give a little bit of advice for um, young programmers, young coders. All right, so that's the outline, the roadmap. So let's start simple, all right. so. If you haven't had PCA, here's kind of the simple version of how it works. Imagine we've got a bunch of people, and this could be thousands of people, thousands of human beings, that we, for each person, we take two measurements. We measure their weight and we measure their height, okay? And if we plotted that data, it might look something like this, right? And what principle, so this is only two-dimensional data, right? What principal components does is it takes all of the dimensions at hand and it forms a new, dimension that's a linear combination of the old dimensions that maximally accounts for the variance in that data. And variance just means the spread here, right? So the weight, you can see the weight kind of goes, the variance for the weight goes from here to here, right? For height, it goes from here to here. But if we look at this end from here to here, that's a longer, there's more variance along this dimension, right? And so what our principal component, what our singular value decomposition would do is it would give us the first principal component that we might think of as size, right? The, another way of thinking about this is it's, it's taking advantage of the fact or it's that, that there's a correlation among normal humans between their height and their weight. Big people tend to be taller, people tend to be heavier, and shorter people tend to be lighter, right? So we might refer to this as size. So big people up here and littler people down here, right? And of course, we can then project the original data set onto that new principal component. We refer to that as the score on principal component one. And so each person now would get a new number that would be their score on the first principal component. So large positive values would be um, bigger people and maybe negative values, depending on where we center the origin, um, would be smaller people. But of course, it keeps going. So the next dimension is, is, is required in PCA to be orthogonal to the first one. And 
we have our projection. I just showed a few points of the projection, the scores on, on PC2. So, but just as, a, just as a reality check here, or as a, as a way of probing your understanding, if PC1 is something like size, what might PC2 be called? Like what, what is someone who's higher, who has a higher score on PC2, what do they tend to be? As opposed to someone down here. So if we're moving along this dimension now in our new, our new space, you know, all we've really done is rotated our axes, right? So like okay, I heard, I think two people tried to jump in. So I guess my, my unmute and sh blurted out strategy failed already. So um, maybe um, one at a time, who, who was, I don't know who was first. I think Emmanuel yeah. was first on team though. Um, okay. If they were going up on the PC2 line, then they'd be taller and lighter. Exactly. So they're so someone who's taller and lighter would be skinny. Yeah. yeah, right. And someone who's shorter and heavier would be a little maybe pudgier or whatever, whatever we want to call them. So yeah, we might call PC2, um, we might call it slenderness or skinniness or something like that, right? So that's a trivial example, right? It, it's sort of like, well, why did you need to do some fancy math to get to these new things? Well, let me show you a really impressive example in this next one. So here is a genetic study in which they took almost 1,400 Europeans, people from France and Germany and Italy and Spain and what have you, and they measured um, what are called SNPs. So SNP, a SNP is a single nucleotide polymorphism. So what it is, it's just a little tiny piece of DNA that for kind of random reasons, these are non-coding, so they don't, they don't make you different, you know, they don't cause any difference in proteins or anything you could measure, but there are differences between human beings, right? And so you can either have for any given polymorphism, and polymorphism just means it differs from different, from person to person. You can have zero copies of, of SNP1 or one copy or two copies, right? You get for each, each gene or each polymorphism, there's two sources, your mom and your dad, right? So SNP1, this particular individual has zero copies of SNP1. They have two copies of SNP2, two copies of SNP3, one copy of SNP5, and so on. So each person is now defined by this, um, what is it, almost 200,000 numbers um, of zeros, ones, or twos, right? And so now we have this huge array, this huge matrix of 1,400 rows and almost 200,000 columns, right? And now we're just gonna take all those 200,000 dimensions and do PCA on them, right? So it's, it works exactly the same way and a typical computer could do this in a few seconds, right? And here's what happens. Here's the first two principal components. Actually, when I'm plotting for each individual in the study now, there's um, each individual is, is represented by two letters. And that's the, the country they came from. So IE stands for Ireland. So this person over here that had um, this score on PC1 and this score on PC2 was from Ireland. And you can see that all the people from Ireland are in this sort of reddish. All the people from Great Britain are in this sort of uh, pinkish. People from Spain and Portugal are down here. So, so here's a question for you. What, what, if you had to put it in words, what might we call PC1? Here's a hint, here's a hint. This is a map of Europe um, with the colors coded as they are here. So here's Ireland, here's Spain and Portugal down here. Here's France where Servan comes from. They're all right in here, right? Here's Russia's up here. Turkey down here, Cyprus. So what 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 do you think PC1 might be called? You have to think back to your geography class. Um, all the countries that are, I guess, lower on the map have a lower score on PCI1 or PC1. So I'm tempted to say it might be like, because the ones that are lower down would be closer to the equator maybe melanin concentration in their skin? Ah, there's nothing about skin color here at all. All it is is, 
All they are is sort of how related they are in PC space, how related they are genetically. So that there could be a correlation with that, but that's not, there's nothing like that in here. Really, it's just telling you how close they live to each other geographically, right? So PC1 is just kind of a measure of how far north south they are. This is north, this is south. So PC1 might be called latitude, right? That's the way we keep track of how far north south we are on the globe, right? The equator is zero degrees and the North Pole is 90 degrees north and the South Pole is 90 degrees south, right? And of course, PC2 is close to what we call longitude, which is a measure of how far east west you are. And in there, it's completely arbitrary, right? East west is related to a place in Greenwich, England, which is arbit arbitrarily because back when all this was figured out, the British were kind of ruling the globe. And so Greenwich was declared the zeroth meridian, right? And so really what this is telling us is that it's pulling out the relatedness. And of course, people who live near each other tend to be more genetically related because they tend to interbreed, right? But, but I don't want to get into all of the geopolitics or, or what have you, but isn't it amazing that we can go from this, which is completely mindless tables of numbers, 200,000 measurements and, and over 1,400 individuals, and boom, we get this beautiful structure, right, that tells us how related these people are and, tell, and tells us where they live, right? Based on our SNP pattern, based on their scores, we could tell where they lived, which is pretty amazing, I think. I don't know, maybe you guys are, are jaded because you're so used to seeing stuff like this, but I still find this rather incredible. And this is just simple linear algebra, right? All right, so that's one example. Any, any thoughts, comments, questions about that? Hearing none, I'll move on. So here's my neuroscience um, example, and you'll see in a second why I'm doing this. Um, so one of the most powerful techniques that came along in the last oh, century was our ability to record the small electrical signals that neurons emit when they're signaling, right? We call them, the, 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 the formal name in neuro, neurobiology is the action potential, but that's kind of unwieldy. So we just call them spikes, and you're going to see why. Because when we, when we go in and record from neurons, actually, we typically record not just from one neuron that we're nearby, but we might hear the signals from this one and this one and maybe even some from this one, right? And it's a problem in neuroscience that we want to be able to determine which spikes belong to which neurons, or at least which spikes belong together and which other spikes belong together as a, being a different neuron, Okay. And just to unpack this for you a little bit, here's just blowing this up a little. You can see now this neuron, one neuron here has a spike that looks like this. A different neuron has a spike that's a little bigger and it's got a little bigger undershoot, right? So how can we figure out which belong together? And that's kind of called sorting spikes or clustering spikes. And again, it's sort of PCA to the rescue. Um, so here's a case where what I've done is I've written a little computer program that goes through and grabs the, the peak of each spike and then grabs the data a certain distance before and after the peak, right? So now they're all aligned on the, on the, the beginning of the action potential. And in this particular brief snippet of, 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 a, of an electrophysiological recording, I've got 98 spikes. And you can see they do kind of tend to cluster um, and in fact, I know that they're different from different neurons because in this case, I generated the data, right? I made these spikes using a program, right? And so I have the ground truth. So I know that all of these green traces belong to one neuron, all of these blue traces belong to a different neuron, and all these red traces belong to a third neuron, right? So I know that because I made, made up the data, right? In, in typical cases, we wouldn't know, but this is just a way of saying is how well does our algorithm perform, right? And so they're different, they're not identical, right? Because I, I, made, I, I created some noise in the, in the parameters when I made each, each spike, all right? So now we do our same thing. So now each, sorry, each neuron or each, each action potential has been reduced to 601 numbers. So this, this is each, each, example has 600 numbers that, that, that describe it. <clears throat> and those numbers are the amplitude, the, the voltage over time. And you can see 
that they're this these measurements are highly redundant, right? They stay at one level and then they go up together and they go down together. And that's exactly the kind of thing that PCA is great at. So here's the, this is a, a plot that shows for each principal component now, and there's, there's um, 600 of them, but I'm only showing the first, that most of them aren't telling us much at all. The singular value is a measure of how much of the variability in the, across all of the different spikes the each principal component accounts for. So you can see that the first one that looks like this, right, accounts for a lot of the variability. And the second one also accounts for a lot of the variability. And the third one less and the fourth and fifth and so on. So that these aren't telling us much at all, but these are telling us a lot. And so what we can do now is we can go back and do exactly what I did in that first slide. I plot the score of each spike on the first two principal components. So here's all of the, the scores of all of the spikes, right? So they're, 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 just, they're just plotted according to their score on principal component one and on principal component two. And just to remind you, so here's all the red spikes, here's all the blue spikes, and here's all the green spikes. So you can see right away with just two principal components from this original 600 dimensions, I can perfectly categorize all of the spikes. So all I'd have to do now is go into my data set and say, okay, um, if the principal component score is less than zero um, on score one and greater than zero on score two, then it's a red spike, right? Neuron one. And if they're both, um, if, if it's less than zero on principal component two and less than five on score on pre PC one, then it's a blue spike. And you can see, right? It's very simple. So that's beautiful. So, and that's still very useful. It's more complicated than that in real life. And we actually now use fairly sophisticated AI algorithms to, to sort real spikes because real spikes are noisier and, and, and more difficult than the, than the fake ones that I generated. So any questions about that? Okay, now we're gonna get, get interesting. And this is where um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some discoveries in neuroscience. Um, and so, these, this is, um, and, and so this is David Hubel on the left. He was my um, advisor when I was a, a postdoctoral fellow as a young student. Um, and his collaborator, Torsten Wiesel, they won the Nobel Prize in Medicine or Physiology in 1981. And what they did is they figured out a lot about how the visual system works in, in cats and monkeys. And they did that by, we're going back to this old picture, by recording from neurons at different parts of the visual system and trying to understand how they represented visual information. So this is getting back to the kind of thing Emmanuel said, but this you'll see is not just pixels. This is doing something much more profound. Um, and so let's, let's see if we can figure out what that is. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna watch two brief movies. And in each movie, um, in the first movie, um, Hubel and Wiesel are recording, this is the brain of a human, but they're recording instead from a brain of a cat in this, in this case. And the cat is anesthetized. So the cat isn't experiencing any pain or, or, or any, any problems. It's just like you would go undergo for a, a surgical procedure. And here they're recording from a structure in the thalamus called the, the LGN, the lateral geniculate nucleus, which is very early in the visual pathway. This is getting back to what Emmanuel was talking about earlier. So this is maybe a very early layer in vision. And what we're going to do is we're going to listen to the spikes that are, we're going to hear the spikes from one neuron. And each time that neuron emits an action potential, what they did is they amplified it and put it over a loudspeaker. And so an action potential, because it's a, <clears throat> it's a rapid change in the voltage, it sounds kind of like a click. So that would be one action potential, like a click. Can you hear the click? Good. Okay. So now what we're going to do is we're going to look at the screen so that animals, the, the cat's eye is focused on a screen in front of it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to rotate the screen now. So we're going to be watching what the cat was watching, right? Its eyes aren't moving around because it's anesthetized. And so we're just going to see the, the spikes. We're going to listen to the spikes of one neuron while they put a, a little spot of light around the screen, okay? Okay. Oops, sorry. I didn't mean to go backwards. I meant to, to pause it. So so 
that what you're hearing, those little pops, those are the action potentials, right? The little pop up. And when the neuron really likes something, when it really gets excited, it goes, brrr, it sounds like a little, you know, someone hammering on a snare drum, right? And so you can see that this little circle in the middle of the screen here is what is called the receptive field. It's the part of the visual space that that neuron really cares about. And when it signals, when it fires a lot of action potentials, it's telling the brain there's something here. Now, the question is, what is it saying to the brain about what's there? All right, so let's listen further. Saying there's light there? Well, there's as much light there now as there was earlier. But clearly the small spot is better than the big spot. Whoa, that's it. ahead a little bit. This is important. So as long as there's an edge somewhere across the, re the receptive field, the cell fires, but it doesn't care whether the edge is vertical or horizontal or, or oblique, right? It's, it's, it's sensitive to contrast, but not orientation. Is everyone clear on what we just saw? Do you have any questions? Because it's important if, if you don't, now's a good time to, to speak up because a lot of the stuff we're gonna talk about now is dependent on this sort of data. This is the rawest of the raw data. Any questions? Did it not fire or did it not fire as much when it was like just a massive white blot because it's, it's more sensitive to contrast? Exactly. We're going to see that in just a second explicitly, Emmanuel. But yes, that's exactly right. It's sensitive to contrast, not just light. So very, 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 very important concept in vision. <laughs> Sorry, uh, Servan. Yes, I wanted to make sure that I understand the screen is what we are displaying to the eye and the sound is how the brain reacts, right? Correct. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Okay. So let's jump ahead and let's, here, let's sort of summarize the data. And this is exactly what, what we were just talking about. So a small spot. So this is the stimulus that was put in the center of the receptive field. And these are the spikes now. Instead of listening to them, we're seeing them. So each spike now is just a, a vertical tick. <clears throat> and time here is going from left to right. And what this means is when the stimulus was on. And this is when it was. So it was off and then on and then off again. Right? And so you see that when a small spot was put in the center of the cells, fired a bunch of spikes. When a slightly larger spot, it fired more spikes. But when that big spot was, was shown, it fired much, many fewer spikes, right? So this was the most effective stimulus. And then you might have noticed when they put a dark, when they masked out the center and just put light in the surrounding region, that actually inhibited the cell from its spontaneous activity. And when they turned that stimulus off right here, they got an, a burst of, of ex excitation of, of more spikes, right? So that's kind of interesting. What it's saying, and this is the way one we conceptualize that, is that it has an excitatory center or an on center. And the reason Hubel and Wiesel called that an on response is because the cell fired more when the stimulus came on. But in the surrounding region, there was a sort of antagonistic set of inputs that, that were called an off response. Because remember, when they just put the annulus on, the cell fired when they turned that stimulus off, right? And the sum of those, when you, they sort of sum linearly so that when you put a big spot that covers both the excitatory center <clears throat> and the inhibitory surround, it's, it kind of zeroes itself out. And what that's saying is that the visual system doesn't care about the total level of light, it cares about contrast. And actually, this is a very old discovery. It was discovered, well, it was discovered in the 1940s 
by a man named Keffer Hartline. And he was actually recording, he was doing the same kinds of experiments that Hubel and Wiesel did, but he was recording from the, the visual system of, of, the, of a horseshoe crab called a limulus, right? So this is a very old trick. And the trick is to don't pay attention when the illumination isn't changing, but to pay attention when there's a change, a contrast, as Emmanuel said, a contrast. And that's a very key part of the visual, of understanding early visual processing. It cares about change, change in time, change in space, change in chromaticity, change in color. And I could give a whole lecture on this, but I'm not now, I'm gonna skip ahead. We're gonna show one more movie here. Only now, instead of recording from the LGN, they're recording from the next layer back in the visual system. Same idea though, neurons are identical. They're just, they fire spikes, just like all neurons communicate and signal by firing action potentials. That's one thing we really do know that Michael Jordan didn't get exactly right. We really know that, that, that action potentials are the computational currency of the brain, right? And you can prove that with a very simple experiment. We have very specific drugs that block the sodium channels, the ion channels that are responsible for generating action potentials. And those are the drugs that you get if you go to the dentist, if you've ever had a cavity drilled, the doctor, the first thing they did was they gave you an injection of a drug called Novocaine or Lidocaine or Marcaine. They're all the same basic drug that blocks those sodium channels that prevents the nerves in that part of your jaw, your mouth, from sending action potentials back to the central nervous system. No action potentials to the nervous system, your brain doesn't know that you're numb, right? You're numb. If we were to do the same injection in your optic nerve here, you would be blind, right? Until the, until the anesthetic wore off, the local anesthetic. All right, so we're gonna play the same game. We're gonna watch the screen, only now we're, we're in primary visual cortex and we're gonna listen to the spikes. skip ahead a little bit. So what they're thinking here is an off response. Later, they're going to mark the off response we do. Let's just jump ahead here. Right. Off, one of the off regions. There's the other off region. And now look. Now the cell only fires when that is. Is it the right orientation? It's off by even just a little bit, the cell is silent. So now this is telling the rest of the brain something much more interesting about what might be out there, an edge of a particular angle, a particular orientation. And of course, there's millions and millions of neurons in even just the visual cortex of the brain. So there's ones that represent all orientation of any given region of space. Isn't that cool? All right, and here, we're just showing that The neuron doesn't care at all about just light. It cares about a contrast and a contrast at a specific angle. Okay. And another feature of this is that because Hubel and Wiesel recorded successively from various levels of the visual system, they were able to put together circuits. And this is going back to what, what Michael Jordan was talking about, right? You can't, you don't just have to know the properties of the individual elements. You have to know how they form into circuits. Well, here's a, an important circuit where here's one LGN neuron that has this receptive field. Here's another one that has a receptive field that's slightly displaced on the retina, and a third one that has one that's even displaced more. And they all make a connection, a synapse, onto this neuron that we're recording from in, in primary visual cortex. And all of those synapses are excitatory. So all this neuron is doing is linearly summing the outputs of these three input neurons, right? And that gives us the receptive field that likes this bar of this orientation, right? Nowadays, what Jan LeCun would refer to this as, as convolution, right? It's creating selectivity through, the, and in the case of the brain, they're encoded in the synaptic weights. In the case of a, of a deep neural network, they're encoded in the weights of one layer onto the next layer, right? 
So we're going to get to, to the analogies now between real visual systems and artificial visual systems. And so Hubel and Wiesel, over the course of 30 years of this collaboration, worked out a lot of the principles of the early stages of visual processing. And we don't, I wish I had time to get, go into all of it, but it's, it's really beautiful work. And as I said, they won the Nobel Prize for this, this work. And you can think of these things in a visual, in a machine vision sense, like each step is, do, each stage is doing various useful things, removing known correlations to represent change or doing a spatial derivative to represent change, representing suspicious coincidence, things that are unlikely to occur in random images, but that we know occur in real images like extended contours, right? Pooling to get invariance. I didn't show you this step, but it's the next step after the simple cell, where now instead of just responding to a light edge, uh, a light edge on a dark background, it responds to the same dark edge on a light background as long as the orientation is the right orientation. So it's the, those neurons are invariant over exact position on the ret on the retina as well as the sign of the contrast. And there's more and more and more. So this goes on. And what it does, you can think of it as taking a very high dimensional object, like all the pixels, this, if this were, you know, this might be several thousand pixels in, in terms of storage in a computer, but the brain is gradually abstracting the important parts of the shape of this cat into a representation that's much more abstract, much more efficiently stored, and much more useful in terms of <clears throat> ultimately identifying the fact that this is a cat, right? The sh it's the shape that matters for most of visual identification. And so these same principles, these exact same principles that Hubel and Wiesel described this sort of hierarchical elaboration of processing were applied by computational scientists now. So here's an early model that was um, done by Tommy Poggio's lab at MIT back in the late 90s. And it, it really slavishly followed this idea that Hubel and Wiesel had discovered in the cat and monkey visual system. And lo and behold, by creating models like this, they could get pretty good performance, right? In other words, they could take inputs that were just bunches of pixels and they could get their, their model to categorize them or even identify individual exemplars, right? And so this is really the earliest example of a, of a convolutional neural network, right? And it was amazing, they, they did well, but they didn't do that well. They were pretty easily fooled, but now look at this. So here's circa 2012, I guess. This is AlexNet and it's doing exactly the same kinds of things that we know visual systems. In fact, when I had, um, I invited Jan LeCun to give a talk at Harvard a few years ago, this is before the, the pandemic, when he talked about the, all the progress in machine vision, he explicitly said that all of these the architecture of all of these networks is, is designed after what we learned from biological visual systems, and in particular, the work of Hubel and Wiesel, right? And so they're doing relatively simple operations at each of these steps. They're doing things like convolution, which is what I showed you um, in the um, example from the simple cell. We'll, so we'll see examples of these later, rectification, pooling, normalization, Right, And by doing it over and over and over again, layer after layer, these, these architectures can do a pretty good job of seeing. And just to give explicit examples, so here's the one that we looked at, the example of how we can get neuronal selectivity by um, encoding synaptic weights. This is what we mean by convolution. Right? Rectification is something that actually is fairly costly in neural networks. Neurons do it automatically, right? Neurons can't fire below zero. They, they fire at either zero spikes or positive after they add up all their inputs, right? So this is the process of rectification. And you'll see this little, like you'll see in a lot of neural network model, you see this ReLU, which just stands for rectif rectifying linear unit, right? <clears throat> this is our linear unit. It's just linear summing its inputs. And then it only sends a response for things that are positive, not negative. Pooling is a way of getting invariance. In other words, you want to be able to recognize a picture of your mother, regardless of whether she appears up in the upper part of your visual field or over to the right or to the left, right? And so that's a kind of invariance, a spatial invariance, or whether or not the image is slightly rotated, that's a rotational invariance, 
or the size of the image, right? We can recognize the nature, the, the, the identity of something invariant to all of these nuisance factors like rotation, um, location, and, and uh, magnification. And finally, normalization is something that we know neurons do and is very useful for keeping our computations within, a, a, within reasonable bounds so they don't blow up, right? So all of these things are components of networks. And, and let me just quickly show you some of the things that neural networks in, in vision can do. Right? And so this is a kind of important historical slide here. The first thing to notice, so what this is, is it's showing the performance in terms of errors. So a bigger bar means worse performance, more errors. And what, the, what, the, the, what each person or, or algorithm was doing was it was presented images and it had to then classify them um, in, in one of several um, hundred different categories. Right? And so what we see is that these first, like this is the, the model that I showed you first of the, the, the Risenhuber and Poggio model. Um, well, here's what humans do. On this particular version of the task that was formalized in this ImageNet large scale visual recognition challenge, humans get about 5% errors, okay? Because it's a challenging task. Early versions of, of the Risenhuber and Poggio, they were up around 30%, nowhere near human performance. But really right around 2012 is when all of a sudden this first deep convolutional neural network, AlexNet, um, really blew the doors off of the competition. And this was, so this is a hackathon. They do it every year, right? And groups of scientists compete to do better and better and better. And you can see that things got better and better. Googlenet um, was approaching human performance. And then as of 2015, things like ResNet and these more modern ones, and this, it's gotten better, but it's gotten better very gradually, um, actually do better than humans on this particular task, right? And this is what we refer to as superhuman performance, meaning it's better than humans. That's all it means, right? But there's a catch. These tasks are very well defined. There's not much noise. There's not much clutter. The images are presented on a noiseless background. And so here, the, the machine learning algorithms are taking advantage of the fact that they can learn things like classification of species or of, of breeds of dogs better than most humans can, right? But there's a catch. The, the machine vision algorithms do much worse as we start to make them images more realistic. That is, degrade them with noise, right? When we're looking at things, often um, if it's dark outside or there's shadows or there's things in front of them that occlude them partially, the machine vision algorithms rapidly, their performance, now, now we're looking at accuracy. So now higher is better. So I, I flipped the, the scale. So now one means perfect performance. And you can see that, that they all do very well with zero noise. But as we add noise along the x-axis here, the performance of the machine learning, of the machine vision rapidly degrades to, to chance, essentially, whereas the humans do much, much better for a longer period of time. Here's another one that I think is really interesting, Look, using what was at the time the state-of-the-art ResNet. When they looked at performance, so here's the sort of basic, right? So they, they and, and there's a little bit of confusion in here. I should change this slide. But what they do is they train the network with a series of images, and they test it with a completely different series of images that the network has never seen. So the fact that these two parrots are identical is misleading, right? In other words, they trained with normal uncorrupted images, and they tested with different uncorrupted images. And in that case, ResNet does better than humans. Now what they did is they trained the network using a, a simple kind of noise called additive uniform noise, meaning all they did was they just took a uniform distribution of small numbers and added them to the image, right? So in this case, they trained the network on images that were corrupted with noise, and they tested on different images, but that were also corrupted with additive uniform noise, so the same noise. Again, the network learned it really well, and, and the performance was superhuman. But then they did a really tiny tweak. And this tiny tweak was that they used a different kind of noise. Instead of additive noise, they use what's called salt and pepper noise, where it either goes up or goes down, right? Now, to you and me, these two images, you barely notice that they're different, right? In each case, you say, well, it's a bird. It's a bird. It's a bird, 
Again, they trained on one set of images corrupted with salt and pepper noise. But now what they did <clears throat> is they tested on a different set of images, but they were just corrupted with the same with additive uniform noise. And under these circumstances, it performed at chance level, meaning it didn't generalize whatsoever, right? So this is something that's completely like unlike a normal visual system, right? So these networks aren't quite learning what we might think they're learning. They perform well under narrow sets of circumstances, um, but they don't generalize very well. And in fact, here's another thing. I don't want you to read the whole thing, but this was an experiment that was done by a bunch of people. Um, the lead author was at MIT, but the other authors were, from, were at Google. Um, and what they showed is that these state-of-the-art convnets, convolutional neural networks, um, they basically are learning a very high dimensional lookup table. They're not categorizing the images like we would, where all the birds would be living in the same part of our neural representation space, right? They're essentially learning a very specific lookup table to the fact that it didn't even matter. They could replace each individual image with a random unstructured random noise and the, and the network learned that just as well. Whereas a human, humans would completely fail at that, right? So they're learning pixels in a way that our, our visual systems are not. Our visual systems are, are extracting structure. Now, that seems like a sort of pessimistic way, but, but the, the, the news is not all bleak. It turns out that these networks are forming representations that are, are at least at early stages very like those in the brains of, of at least monkeys and probably humans as well. And this is where I want to get to this final concept of the synergy between machine vision and real vision. And here I'm going to talk about some work. This is my second graduate student, Carlos Ponce, who did his PhD with me back in um, 2000, the mid, the early 2000s. Uh, I think he graduated in 2008 or nine. He's now an assistant professor um, in my department. He, he was at Wash U for a while, and now he's back at Harvard. He came up with this idea of essentially using convnets to help us study the visual systems of monkeys, right? Sounds kind of, kind of weird, but here's the idea. We can take things that we learn from the monkey brain, we can test their efficacy, we can anticipate possible other explanations for how the cells come to be the way they are, and these will give us ideas for new experiments to test in real visual systems. So let's look at a specific example of how this works. All right, so here's something that Carlos did. It was published in one of our most prestigious journals, a journal called Cell in 2019. And, and let's start here. So these codes are the codes that would exist. So these, the representations in, in something like AlexNet are just high dimensional, they're just strings of numbers, right? But they mean something to the network. The network can take those numbers and using them can classify images, right? So he took codes that existed at very high levels, deep levels of, let's say, AlexNet, just to make things simple. He then used a different kind of a neural network, again, a, a machine vision network, but this is what's called a generative neural network, where you can feed in the codes and it will produce an image, right? So then what he did was he showed those images to monkeys while recording from their neurons. And he used the neurons, he used how well they activated the neurons as his objective function. Meaning he selected of all these various random images, the ones that made the neuron fire the most spikes, the brrrr that you heard when you got the, the thing just right. And then he took those and he took the most successful. So now he's judging fitness based on how, how much they, they excited the neuron, one particular neuron that he's recording from. He took the best of those and then used a genetic algorithm, again, something out of machine learning, to randomly generate a new generation of visual stimuli that were based on combinations of the ones that drove the neuron the best from the previous generation. So it's, it's a lot of computing, Right, but the, the gold standard is how well do they make the neuron fire, right? And so Carlos was able to take this strategy and evolve images that were extremely effective at activating neurons at high levels of the visual system, 
right? Things that looked like faces, right? And that's what we know neurons in this part of the brain respond to, at least when all we use are natural images. <clears throat> but the really, really cool thing, and I'm going to go through this kind of fast. Don't worry about the details. I, I'm happy to go over it with you later if you want, is that he was able by th these generations now are after going through the genetic algorithm and testing them on the neurons, evolving, testing, evolving, testing, to drive, to find neurons that drove the neurons very, very well. And in fact, drove them much better and they were reliable. So in other words, starting with different random seeds, they would, the neuron would reliably evolve the same basic image, right? And what he was really able to show is that ultimately these synthetic images made the neurons fire much more vigorously than any natural image that he could find, right? It doesn't mean there maybe there's some natural image out there that's better, but given how much these neurons have been tested with other, so it, it, it's unlikely. So what, what this is saying is something very deep and mysterious a bit about the representations of visual features in the monkey's brain and by association in our brains. And we know from a lot of testing like psychophysics where we ask that monkey's visual systems are very, very similar to our own. So in that sense, they're a very good model of human vision. And it turns out that these, these models, that these, these artificial models, the machine vision models, are also very similar in certain deep ways to the monkey's visual system, right? And so this, I think we've essentially what Jan LeCun and other people in the field of machine vision have done, have created a new preparation, a new thing to try to understand with respect to vision, where as we use the tricks we learned from biological visual systems to build better machine vision systems, the, the advantage of these is that we can go in and we can probe them in much more detail than we can the real brain, right? We can do tons of experiments. We can ask why are they working the way they're working? And these in turn give us ideas for new experiments, which then will reveal some of the tricks we hope that nature is using to make better and better machine vision systems. All right, so that's the last kind of point I wanted to make. And now I just wanna close with some kind of big picture things. And this, is, this was fun because I was walking around sort of over the holiday thinking about what advice I would give to your generation of, of young coders and, and scientists. So the big, the, if you walk away with one thing, it's don't be narrow. What do I mean by don't be narrow? Well, let's, let's unpack that a little bit. So the first thing I wanna make clear is that coding skills such as what you're learning from, from Code for Fun are incredibly important, really, really important. Um, learning how to think algorithmically is valuable no matter what walk of life you go into. Um, it's taking a complicated problem and breaking it down into steps, right? That are logical, follow logically, right? That's an extremely valuable skill to learn it gives you power, right? If you can code, you can take your ideas, you can instantiate them in a computer algorithm. You can test your ideas. You can use vis powerful visualization to explore data sets, all sorts of really important things. And of course, you're learning the value of teamwork. All of those are incredibly valuable skills, but I would argue they're not enough, right? And here's why, right? You have to understand the underlying principles. You need to like, you don't want to just um, take a bunch of widgets and string them together and say, oh, this did better than that. At some level, if you're really going to do make the next generation of better algorithms, you have to understand them at a deeper level. So one recommendation is to learn the underlying probability and statistics, right? This is what all of your machine vision is riding on, right? That's the, these are the Maxwell's equations of machine learning and artificial intelligence, right? And, and it's not just probability and statistics. Obviously, linear algebra is important. Calculus is important. I'm not saying you have to become mathematicians, but you need to understand the underlying principles well enough um, to develop the next generation of algorithms. The, the third principle is that big discoveries happen at the intersection of disciplines, right? So don't just pay attention to computer science and AI 
pay attention to neuroscience, right? That's as Warren Weaver said, that's where we're gonna learn the tricks that, that will advance the next generation of algorithms, right? Um, there's lots of examples, right? One of the most exciting periods in the history of science was the early 1900s when physics and chemistry kind of bumped up against each other. And that led to the revolution of quantum mechanics, which completely revolutionized our understanding of the way the world works. Um, very, very important, right? Or, um, well, there's lots of examples, right? But for artificial intelligence, I would say the principles of, of animal and human behavior are incredibly important. And you should read books, like one of the best books you could read, I would argue, is one called Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman, who's a cognitive psychologist who figured out a lot about the algorithms that we use when we, when we try to reason. Really, really good, great stuff. And then finally, the last principle I'll leave you with is that algorithms have consequences. And the algorithms that you guys are gonna develop are gonna have more and more consequences in society. Here's just one example. In the state of Virginia, and I just heard a talk about this um, from a, a woman who was studying these at Berkeley, and a woman named uh, Professor Stevens. In Virginia, they use what are called risk assessment algorithms to guide sentencing of convicted criminals. They're trying to predict how likely is this person if we let them out early to, re, to reoffend, right? And these algorithms are far from perfect. In fact, as she explained, they're basically logistic regression. <laughs> so we're getting back to, to statistics, right? And machine learning. Um, but you've, you've probably all heard of the disaster that happened when um, Google um, used uh, machine vision algorithms to classify faces of human beings. But those algorithms had only been trained on white faces, uh, Caucasian faces, right? So they did a terrible job at classifying people who weren't white. In fact, they, they did terrible things like they classified um, people from of African American, uh, who African Americans as gorillas, right? So just a, a hideous mistake done because people weren't paying attention and weren't thinking about the ethical real world consequences. And, and these are the domains of, of not what we can do, but what we ought to do, right? And it's important to learn how to think about those problems. And you're not gonna learn how to think about those problems in math. You learn how to think of them in your philosophy and religion classes. And in fact, there's the last point here. Um, at Harvard, one of my colleagues, a philosopher named Allison Simmons got together with the CS people um, and created what's called embedded ethics. And you see the capital CS. So what they do is in computer science, in the computer science curriculum, they're simultaneously embedding ideas about how to think about the ethics, the moral, the moral foundation of the decisions of what we ought to do, not just what we can do. And those things are important for your generation to grapple with, because even though our algorithms right now are relatively weak, they're going to become stronger and stronger and more and more pervasive in making decisions in society. And it's important that we get it right, because getting it wrong has terrible consequences. All right. So that's the end of my little rant here. Um, I realize we got, oh, we're almost at the one and a half hour mark, but I'm happy to stick around to answer any questions that you might have or to give you references for things that, that we talked about. So let me stop sharing and... Um, All right, um, so, so I, have, I do have a question on the algorithms have consequences because I've read some things that like, um, like basically, um, bias in society has been like found in like also reflected in AI. For instance, if we look at like Google Translate, and sometimes like some languages have like gender neutral words, it can change it within like she's a teacher and like um, he's a soldier. Like that. I remember seeing that somewhere. And like, how do we combat that? And like, how do we change that? Absolutely, quickly? absolutely. So so you can see how these get get into these algorithms, right? Because a lot of them, especially if if it's a deep neural network right? It means that it was trained, right? So it's going to learn biases that are in the training set. So, so if it was trained on a data set where most of the teachers had female names and most of the mathematicians had male names, it's going to reflect that bias, right? And so there's, there's a whole um, field now that encompasses law, there's a, there's a professor at the law school 
um, whose name is escaping me right now at, at Harvard Law, who's about the fairness of algorithms. So really, it, it, there's no magical bullet here. It's, it's a matter of, of building the appropriate data sets to train our algorithms on that, that eliminate these biases. Um, and it's a matter of being aware, right? So bias is a, it's a very deep topic that's really fascinating in statistics, right? You can always get more precision by getting a bigger, bigger sample, right? But if that sample is biased, all you'll do is become more and more convinced of the wrong answer, right? Yeah. And one of my colleagues at, in the statistics department, Zhaoli, um, Zhaoli um, Meng, uh, Zhaoli, sorry, Zhaoli Meng, um, has published, uh, just a, published a big article in Nature about this, what he calls the, the big data paradox, which is exactly this. Insofar as there's subtle biases in these, the data sets that we analyze or that we use to train our algorithms, um, we will become more and more confident of the wrong answer. So there's no magic bullet, Jeffrey. You just have to be aware of them. You have to be aware that of what you're using to train your, your algorithms. All right, cool. Right? So it, it's, it, it's, it requires thinking. It requires thinking. It requires knowledge of society. It requires sensitivity. It requires empathy, right? Um, and there's, there's no right answer. There's no magic bullet. Um, but just to constantly be on guard um, for these biases that that creep in, because you're exactly right that that's exactly what happens. And, 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 and I'll just add one more thing. I think for the advice that Rick gave, I think it was perfect and whatnot. Um, I think from my perspective, for students of your age and experience with all of this stuff, it can be really powerful to think about the problems and the challenges in the real world that you want to solve and then play with the sort of widgets as Rick referred to them, which can be the prepackaged programming techniques and whatnot. Play with those, try to solve your problem and whatnot. And if your problem isn't being solved by those widgets, then that's the impetus to say, what's the math that's going on underneath here and how can I improve that, right? So you can, you can sort of reverse the process of understanding what's at the lowest level by figuring out what am I interested in? What are the issues I want to tackle? And then backing it down to the level of how, what, what needs to be improved? What isn't working as well as it could be? And, and how do I change that, right? So, um, you know, I think that's what Hack High School tries to do for a lot of you is to introduce you to the problems and, and give you the exposure to what widgets are out there. And then, and then we're hoping that, you know, you have high school and college years to sort of get into the math and get into the actual um, more technical analysis of this. And, and hopefully you can become someone like Carlos for Rick, you know, um, you can, you can change how people think about this stuff. And one, one thing, you know, we were talking about bias earlier, Carter, that the, the biggest cognitive bias that I think is the most pernicious in, in society and the way we think is called confirmation bias. And what it means is that we're very good at collecting data or filtering data to confirm what we already think is true, right? And it, it filters into how we do experiments and how we do our widgets or play with our widgets. We might say we build a, an algorithm that can see and we just, we just put more things into it that we think you know, make it see a little better. But, but the way you really learn about your widgets is by trying to break them, right? And the way you learn about experiments or the way you really learn the way we advance in science is by disproving or by trying to disprove hypotheses, not just trying to accumulate more evidence to confirm our pet hypothesis, but by coming up with the answer that breaks our hypothesis, right? And, and th this, again, this goes back like, like, we don't know how the brain does this. We have some ideas that, that maybe come from Bayesian inference, but the confirmation bias was figured out by psychologists um, back in the 40s and 50s at, at Stanford, out, you know, out where you guys are. Um, the famous experiment was, was they took a bunch of college students and they, they, they said, okay, here, we're gonna give you a, a sequence of three numbers that are the example that were generated by some rule. And your job is to figure out what that rule is, right? So here's the three numbers. The three numbers are two, four, and six. And you can, you can, the only way you can try to figure out the rule is by positing, proposing sequences of numbers. 
And we'll tell you, yes, it's a good example of the rule of, of being generated by the rule, or no, it's not, right? And what was amazing is in this first experiment done by a guy named Wasson, W-A-S-S-O-N, almost all of these Stanford students got it wrong. They didn't get the right rule. And the reason was, was after they heard, okay, so here's an example, two, four, six. Well, then they said, okay, is 10, 12, 14 one? And they said, yes. Uh, is, is, you know, seven, nine, 11 one? And they said, yes. And they said, ah, so it's numbers. You know, so what, how would you think about that? If I said two, four, six is an example, but I want you to figure out the rule and then you have to tell me the rule at the end. At two. Okay, that's, that's a rule that could have generated that sequence, but, but the underlying rule is something maybe different, right? It could be more general, right? And so you have to figure out what that underlying rule is by proposing other sequences, right? So you might say, oh, is one, three, five, one? And I would say, yes. But if all you do is propose examples that fit the, the rule that you think it is, add two, you'll never get to the bottom line, to the, to the actual answer, right? And that's why the Stanford students didn't get it. This, the rule, the underlying rule was any sequence of, of increasing numbers, right? So the only way you'd find that out is by saying, okay, is, is eight, four, two a sequence? And I would say, no, it's not. Um, or is, right? So in other words, it's only by posing counterexamples that you really get at the rule. And so this, this led to a whole cottage industry of psychology experiments under the, that come, have come to be known as confirmation bias. But we see it all the time, right? People who are to the right of the political spectrum, right, watch Fox News. People to the left watch MSNBC. And they're, all they're getting is stuff that confirms what they already believe. So try to break your algorithms, break your widgets. That's how they, you get them better. And there's a whole field right in machine learning called GANs, generalized adversarial networks, where you make a network better by make, pitting it against another network that tries to, to ruin it. And that works, that's, they're really powerful. They're really powerful. So that gets, that gets you around, that's an algorithmic way around confirmation bias. So, okay, I should stop. <laughs> I have a question, which is a little bit on a side note. So you did say that um, one of your uh, students were doing experiments on monkeys. And uh, I've talked to other um, people who have been working at Harvard and I referred your name and they're like, oh yeah, that's the monkey guy, right? <laughs> so <laughs> apparently you have, you have a lab over there with real live monkeys. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? What, and is it complicated? I mean, there's a lot of rules and a lot of, uh, yes, <laughs> tell us. So that's, that's a topic for about another two hours, Survive. So <laughs> yeah. um, the, the bottom line is, yes, we, we do experiments with animals. Almost all biologists do. We use rhesus monkeys. It's very complicated. It's very tightly regulated by federal agencies and local so before we can, any, any experimentalist in the United States can do any experiment that involves any animal, any animal with a backbone. So if you wanna work on fruit flies, you don't need to get approval from the, the Animal Care and Use Committee. But if you wanna use rats or monkeys or rabbits or whatever, you have to get approval that everything you're doing is scientifically necessary, that you're doing it as humanely as possible. So all of our animals we use only positive reinforcement rewards. We, any surgical procedures we do are under our same anesthetics that humans get. So it's very tightly regulated. There are still some people who don't think that that's okay. And in fact, I've changed over the years. I do fewer experiments now with monkeys than I used to. And, and partly um, it's not because I think they're unethical, um, but, but um, it's, it's a complicated um, moral decision. To, to do experiments with animals is what, what maybe that's where we should leave it um, and say that yes it is very tightly regulated and done responsibly um, but it's a it's a societal question really whether um, you know in, in other words we the, the government oversees this work and we have to adhere to regulations and ultimately we have people 
from the from the community on the committees that have to approve the experiments. Um, but it's it's a it's a question that society has to decide. Do we want to fund research that that uses animals? If we didn't do research with animals, we wouldn't have vaccines. We wouldn't have machine vision networks. We wouldn't you know there's a lot of stuff we would forego. But that's a that's a an ethical decision that that it, there's no right answer to. Yeah. I've given a lot of presentations about about this topic, so. Well, thank you very much for taking the time. That was uh, very enriching. We have this video uh, recorded, so we will share it with the students who are um, who missed it or want to, to check it out later or even to review because there's a lot of content that, uh, that we will want to unpack, unpack a little bit more. So thanks a lot. Uh, you'll see in the chat, uh, everybody's on. Uh, starting to, to thank you. Uh, students, really make sure that you are taking the opportunity as, uh, as much as possible to, to attend those kind of lectures because as you're searching on what you want to do uh, in the next few years, there's a lot, right? There's a lot of things. And um, people like Rick are here to share with you what they have done with their life and how they're impacting others. And maybe that would be a field that might interest you. But so before you, you decide, you have to kind of explore, right? So um, help us, you know, uh, provide this kind of event. And thank you, Carter. Thank you, thank you, Rick. Uh, this was really great. And uh, I wish all of you guys a happy new year. And, uh, um, and then, you know, I'll let you guys go. Thanks for Thank inviting you. me, Sirvan. Um, yes. I really enjoyed uh, meeting the students and, and getting to know them a bit. And I look forward